Hello everyone and welcome to a short walkthrough of our workflow in computer graphics production. I hope that the home office has been treating you kindly in these tough times and I'm glad we can meet at least virtually. This talk is sponsored by Intel and will alongside highlight some of their technology that enables the tools we use in our daily work. My name is Yurai and I'm a co-founder alongside my wife Veronica of a boutique digital studio specializing in high-end architectural visualization. We currently celebrate one decade in the industry and our portfolio spans architecture, interior design, real estate and product design. Coming from an architectural background, outside of creating renderings, we also advise on or provide a design service to our clients. By loving both design and computer graphics alike, we enjoy the seamless blend of these worlds that keep our work fresh and enjoyable. It forces us to adapt to ever-changing circumstances and learn an incredibly diverse set of skills. Our vision is simple, find great projects to work on, make beautiful images, and most importantly, always have fun and enjoy ourselves. If there's a silver lining to this job requiring the use of a powerful workstation, it's the option to build it yourself. How many cores are enough? All of them, alongside varied gadgets. The first stage of our work is pre-production. We research, brainstorm and play around as much as we end up polishing the result to its final quality. The primary purpose of conceptualization is to think of the image. What sort of emotion should the picture convey? What color palette and light would achieve that? The client's brief can be elaborate or as minimal as a napkin sketch. We do our best to coalesce it into a mutually shared vision. When building the vision for the image, I draw upon inspiration from a multitude of sources. There's a mental library of images in my head from personal experiences traveling and exploring, or a visual library of work from various media such as photography. You don't need much outside of your head to come up with a good start of the project, but taking a laptop on travels means that I can act on my inspiration anywhere. The focal tenet of our work is always striving for our next project to be better than last, always adding something unique to the project. We dive in fully and give it absolutely everything. It's still something different, but it's always there. We do it because we love to experiment, but it's also vital in setting our work apart. Pushing polygons around may feel like a chore, but the same can't be said for cloth simulation. Using tool intended for the fashion industry, Coupled with tailoring experience, lets us create more lifelike fabrics, infusing sterile renderings with a soft touch. Upfront effort on creating unique, high-quality assets pays on in the future as well, getting a lot of reuse. Here are just some of the projects this one made its way into. But we can use it also more traditionally to dress up a digital entourage. Here is the creation of an apron for the chef in Michelin restaurant, which we designed it alongside making marketing renderings. Our newly dressed up chef adds to the dynamic of the image and helps it to tell a story. Simulation can get you close, but there is a certain natural level of detail only found on actual real world items. Enter our struggle to fit queen size bed in our makeshift photo studio in the living room. Above, you can see Veronica with a broken foot doing plenty of ninja photo work. For a good result, you need flat lighting, thousands of photos, plenty of computation power and a steadfast patience. Mistake in a setup and it's all for naught. But succeed and a lifelike replica, after plenty of processing, will give the image a haptic feeling unable to be replicated by conventional modeling methods. We eventually combined the methods and added photoscanner detail onto simulated meshes for displacement maps, bridging the best of both worlds. Another kind of beneficial assets are textures, and for us, 
particularly high dynamic spherical photos used for image-based lighting. Here is Veronica again, shooting a panorama from a high-rise building for the restaurant image. And here is set panorama of Bratislava, the city we are from. This high dynamic 360 panorama provides accurate lighting and reflections for the scene as well as perfectly positioned background environment. It can also be used for product lighting, mainly when used with interior shot panorama. This is our old living room, sparsely populated with basic furniture, but it doesn't hold it back from lighting a high-end product visualization set. Enjoying this highly useful process, we thought of merging our work with hobbies and photographing them across our travels. So came Lisfera. A marketplace of digital locations shot in high dynamic range to be used to light up everything from architecture to automotive. To create this, we capture a set of panorama photos of the right exposures, process them in paid GUI, and calibrate to match the real world intensity of light. Alongside this, we also photograph classic photos to be used as backplates. Example of our renderings of Corvette Stingray using our HDRI sets. The objects fit naturally into their surrounding environment and match in light and color tones. Whether it's creating complex meshes or high resolution textures, powerful hardware enables it to be in production speed capacity. And now we move into my favorite part of the process which is where the magic happens, and abstract digital shapes transform into captivating photorealistic images. Texturing is a cornerstone of CGI production. Whether in computer games, movie VFX, or architectural visualization, even in the age of complex shaders, it all starts with an underlying bitmap. Nowadays, there are plenty of ready-made texture sets to be bought, but when we require something specific, we do it ourselves. I start by finding a useful reference for what I'm after to remind me of every detail required. Although texturing is increasingly done procedurally, I still make plenty of processing manually. In this case, to manually remove light and reflection through high pass filtering to end with a flat base ready for physical based shading. The best case scenario is always photographing or scanning your own source. But you have to work with what you're able to get, which is where machine based learning upscaling can really save the day. Here, using Topaz AI Gigapixel, using an open Intel Vino toolkit to boost performance. Afterward, I create a set of variations of the clean and up bitmap to drive different shading attributes like depth and reflection. If the most straightforward way is manual, I do so, but also incorporate tools such as Quixel Mixer or Substance Alchemist. Like previously showcased measure sets, good texture sets are reused across other projects, placing importance on making every detail right. The right materials make the image feel haptic and identifiable. The water looks like and feels like water. A suitable material can be as simple as a color defining its absorption at depth and the structure of its surface when rippled from the wind. As long as the physical properties like refraction are correctly set, we got ourselves a lovely pool. Continuing to slightly more complex material, I like to replicate the logic of its real-world counterpart. A principle of layering keeps everything tidy and flexible. A low-frequency map containing larger scale wrinkles is overlaid with a high-frequency map defining the fluffiness. This lets me create variations on the look and reuse it as a base for the future similar materials of the same family. And lastly, complex materials that require a bit more research into their logic before embarking on crafting the shader. Every materials is primarily about observance of reality. Replicating the complexity of nature requires smartly observing the infinite variations it has. 
a tree contains older and younger leaves, older darker and shinier towards the core, younger more translucent. Each leaf is slightly different in shape and texture, color, tone and hue. It's vital that all materials in the scene receive the same base attention, as a single wrong one can quickly destroy the illusion. Light is what ultimately makes or breaks the image. Carefully chosen light creates mystery, reveals the shapes and textures of a space, is the most defining attribute of architecture, and we don't have a set approach on how to achieve that. I start as simple and single natural sunlight, or go as complex as necessary with full-scale virtual studio lights. It's often details outside of manipulating the light that makes the most significant difference, as shown here by accurately modeling the street outside. Nothing in this image but a natural sunlight and a city outside modulating how it enters the space. Finding the right angle for the time of the day might have taken quite some time though. My personal approach is to have the light feel natural and effortless, yet subtly captivating and inviting. I want the image to create a sense of longing to be there. Creating that feeling may not often happen as easy as throwing light into space and just waiting to see what happens. Some situations call for deliberate and sophisticated control, shaping the light in a way that portrait photographers do to find the most flattering one. After finding the natural light to be insufficient to attractively portraying this space at any single moment, I added additional light through softboxes. Here you can see me controlling that prehand the light mixer in Corona rendering engine. Which brings us to our engine of choice, Corona Render, CPU-based engine powered by Intel Embry high-performance ray tracing kernels. It's easy to learn, flexible in nature. It is being used across various industries, as shown in their website gallery, although still actively showing its architectural visualization roots. But for us, as the artist to use it, it's mainly a vehicle for creativity, due to its straightforward eat of use and unobtrusive nature. It is as close to the magic button as it gets, so we can focus on being virtual designers, stylists, photographers. Also, I have a popular forum thread there, the bot document my work approach and answer and help any artist learn anything from our production. Being open about our workflows and sharing techniques is what got me personally started in this industry. I would love to keep that culture going for the benefit of us all. Corona is built around Intel Embry and also features Intel Open Image Denoise, an open source denoising filter to facilitate faster renderings using machine-based learning AI. We don't use denoising in our final renderings, but it vastly facilitates the speed at which we can iterate. At this point, we hit the render button and pray we don't cook our husky dog if it's nearby, although she absolutely loves the noise of buzzing computer fans. Strange. Better not forget to hit the air conditioning. And moving to the last stage of creation, the post-production. Our general philosophy is to enhance, not fix. So in many cases, the post-production is merely about adding finishing touches here and there. In this I'm slightly adjusting the contrast to make it more punchy, boosting the glare from skylight and compositing in fog. The overall goal is to get reasonably close to workflow analogous with raw photography. 
but we don't shy away from more compositional approach. If compositing 2D elements enhance the image, either due to flexibility or being more realistic, that is what is chosen. Here, I'm compositing in the background, which would be hard to create in satisfying quality, fully 3D, in any reasonable time frame, or if at all. With all done, we can share our work with the world. Being seen in the creative industry can be just as important as creating itself. It's a joy for every artist to show their work and seek inspiration from others. It's also the primary vehicle in driving the client's interest. Every involved party needs to receive correct credit so that the work can be rightly attributed. If there is anything you would like to ask me, Write to me under any of these channels and I'll try to find time to get back to you. That would be it and thank you for your attention.